once around the, the ocean worlds of the Saturnian system. The Cassini mission, shown here in this artist's impression, went to Saturn, but it wasn't the first probe to do so. We had the Voyager probes pass by earlier. They revealed some fascinating detail about some of the worlds, but the Cassini mission really made all the difference. So let's have a look at these moons of Saturn, which is what we're talking about. Titan, first of all, discovered by Christian Huygens back in 1655. So bright that really you can see it very easily, even with a small telescope or a pair of binoculars as a little point of light that always seems to be just so far away from Saturn, a few planet diameters and orbits round in a period of around about a month. It's a big moon. It's 5,150 kilometers in diameter. That makes it larger than the planet Mercury. And at one stage, we thought this was the largest moon in the solar system. But that title is now taken by Ganymede, because when we look at Titan, what we are seeing is the cloud tops, the top of its very smoggy atmosphere, rather than the rocky planet like object underneath. And so if you take the, the diameter to be the rocky bit, Ganymede beats it by a very small amount. So when we look at it with a telescope, then no matter how much we zoom in, all we see is this bland, smoggy, yellow cloud layer. It's made of about 150% of the density of the Earth's atmosphere, mostly nitrogen. It's got traces of methane and other organic compounds in there, and it's those organics that are making up that smog. Cold, minus 180 degrees C. After all, it's about 1 billion miles from the sun, so it doesn't get a lot of heat. But the atmosphere does warm the planet up some. Uh, there is a small greenhouse effect caused by the sun's rays percolating down through to the surface and uh, the, the infrared radiation unable to escape back out. But so cold on the surface that all of the water is frozen up hard as iron. And in fact, much of the rock surface that you think you are looking at is in fact ice. There is a tremendous amount of water on Titan. Now, the Cassini mission was able to carry out a number of flybys and it took a special infrared camera with it so it could see through that smog layer down further into the atmosphere and in some regions down to the surface. And so we have this uh, planet-like world here that looks suspiciously like the Earth in many ways. We have the clouds in the atmosphere. You can see through and see uh, two types of terrain lower down that look like almost land and sea. But, uh, well, there are lakes and there are rivers and there are mountains underneath those clouds, as we shall see. Another shot here in black and white of some clouds high in the Titanian atmosphere. And the spots at the top there, here, nearer the pole, those are in fact lakes. And we shall see more about the lakes in a moment. Another shot of some clouds taken showing the weather changing on Titan. So here there are some bubbly clouds in the left-hand picture over the top of some lakes. And then a little bit later, they've moved further north, uh, blowing around in the Titanian atmosphere with the winds there. But where the clouds part and we are able to see down to the surface, we see all these features of lakes and rivers running in channels. You can see a nice round sort of kidney bean shaped lake in the top right picture there. And at the bottom, all those river channels with that uh, forking dendritic appearance so that the channels are meandering downhill, carving away, getting bigger, and then flowing downhill. Um, and what's flowing in them is not water because it's too cold. It's liquid natural gas. It's methane and ethane mixed together, 
probably with other materials dissolved in them. And when those rivers terminate, they flow out into the lakes. And this is the Kraken Mare, as it's called, on Titan here. You can see all round the edge of the dark region where river channels are running down into the lake there. Now, the main point of this photograph is the inset area, shown with that white square around it. That's a promontory from the land area reaching out into the lake. And the images on the left show how that changed from date to date. So from July 2013 to August of 2014, and then onwards into 2015, the shape of those fingers of land changed. But it wasn't the land changing, it was the level of the lake. This was the seasons on Titan seeing more or less of the liquid flowing into the lake, which was then gradually evaporating back up into the atmosphere in the a very, very similar manner to the way that the water cycle on Earth sees rain, run down channels, flow into seas and lakes, and then evaporate back into the atmosphere. So an incredibly Earth-like world, but in the deep freeze. And also in the deep freeze of the volcanoes. We see volcanoes on Titan, but they are ice volcanoes, so-called cryovolcanoes, low temperature volcanoes and very much it is the case that if methane and ethane are performing the functions that water performs in our geological cycles then it is uh, water performing the functions of rock here on titan around its equator there is a major ridge which has been detected and this is ice this is a major ridge of ice running around the, the central part of Titan. And that is essentially a sort of planet-wide mountain range of ice mountains, quite incredible. Now, back in 2004, when the Cassini mission first arrived at Saturn, it had a passenger, it had the Huygens probe from the European Space Agency hitching a ride with it. And that was then dropped and was able to navigate to Titan and then parachute down through Titan's atmosphere and take some amazing photographs on the way down. And I love this one. We've got a mountain ridge in the center with different arms of the mountain reaching outwards. And then in the valley to the left of the mountain, you can see river channels carved into the ground in the valley. It's a little bit of a fisheye lens effect going on here. Um, the probe was falling and spinning and uh, taking wide angle pictures. So stitching them together created this slightly strange look. And then the probe made it to the ground and it took this photograph. It's landed on either a beach or a dried up riverbed. And the river would have been, again, methane and ethane running along and all of the pebbles that you see here are very rounded. They're probably made of ice, substituting for rock, and have been rounded by the erosion forces of being washed downstream when this river was flowing. So perhaps we landed at the wrong season. So Titan is amazing. A lot of water there, but cycles based on other chemicals fascinating to think whether even biological processes could somehow make use of a different solvent not water but uh, liquid natural gas and perhaps be able to form living creatures and there is a new mission heading out to titan called the dragonfly mission and that will take a quadricopter a drone with it that will be able to fly around the surface and we should learn an awful lot more about this fascinating world. But Titan gets all the press. The other moons of Saturn are incredibly interesting as well. This is Rhea, smaller. It's the second in line after Titan, only 1,500 kilometers, around about 1,000 miles in diameter. 
got a few craters all over the surface there. Um, second largest moon of Saturn, ninth largest moon in the solar system. So it's still fairly substantial. It has a thin atmosphere around it, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And again, a, a chilly minus 174 degrees centigrade measured on the surface there. Now, the fancy uh, thing about Rhea is that it has moons, uh, sorry, not moons, rings. It has rings around it. These were detected by Rhea passing in front of a star, and the starlight dipped three times on either side of Rhea, indicating three separate rings of material. So not only does Saturn have rings, but its moon Rhea does as well. And in fact, around the edge of the planet, the light curve dipped very irregularly, either showing that those rings are going in further towards the surface of the planet, or that there was an atmosphere with clouds in. Um, and we're not quite sure what that was really telling us. If you compare the trace for Rhea there with what happened when another of Saturn's moons, Tethys, passed in front of a star, there was a much cleaner eclipse. The light just dropped and came back again without really any fuss while the uh, moon was moving in front of the star. So no rings and certainly less of that ragged behavior at the edges. Another thing that's been known about Rhea for some time is that it's uh, orbiting around Saturn tidally locked, just like our moon does with us. It always keeps one face pointing towards Saturn. And as a result of that, as it goes around its orbit, there is a leading face and a trailing face. And the leading face is white and frosty. It's probably picking up ring particles as it goes around. And then the trailing edge seems to be dirty and browner in colour. And we think that's tholins, organic material that's accumulated on the surface. We also see ice cliffs where the uh, coating of Rhea, which is probably an ice crust, has cracked and revealing that there is a liquid water ocean, probably kept warm by radioactivity or tidal effects of interactions with the other moons interior to Rhea. And that's absolutely fascinating because, again, this is, means it's a lot of ice and possibly even some liquid water at a warmer temperature. Um, and that's one of those environments that would be very interesting from the point of view of potential habitat for some form of life. So that's Rhea. Dione, the third moon of Saturn, is very, very similar. It's a little bit smaller, 1,100 kilometers, ranks 15th in the solar system in terms of the size of moons. And again, seems to exhibit all those signs of an internal liquid water ocean buried underneath 100 kilometers of ice. When we look at Rhea, it is also tidally locked with one face covered in white frosted material and the other face, the trailing edge, covered in uh, fewer craters, but um, with ice cliffs and all those dirty organic tholins. The top picture is the surface of Rhea unrolled onto a rectangle and the lower picture, a side on view of the uh, fascinating little world with a few craters and those ice cliffs and the brown tholins. Now, I've mentioned tholins a few times. Tholins is a sort of loose grouping of molecules made of rings and chains of carbon and nitrogen with hydrogen attached all around in all sorts of different combinations. And the shapes and nature of some of these are not dissimilar to what you get in the nucleotide bases of DNA the A, T, C, G of DNA and the U of RNA. These are typically double rings with some nitrogens in one of the rings or attached to it. And so uh, we are seeing that these moons in the outer solar system and indeed many other bodies 
have these complex organic molecules all over the surface. So if this is not a recipe for brewing up interesting chemistry, um, then I don't know what is. And then the other star of the show really revealed to us by Cassini was Enceladus. This is the picture that I just love of Enceladus. It shows what's called the tiger stripes. Now, the tiger stripes are not orange with black, but white with blue. So I don't quite know why they called them that. But this is an ice covering all over the southern hemisphere of Enceladus here with these blue cracks down through the ice. And here's a full globe view showing that that is what's going on on the southern hemisphere. On the northern hemisphere, things are a bit different. No tiger stripes, but some craters. And Cassini discovered that in backlit views of Enceladus, those tiger stripes are venting plumes of material into space. And the probe was then able to fly back round, fly through the plume and make detections of the composition of the plumes, finding water and even organic molecules and molecular hydrogen. So what we think is that there is a rocky core with an ice crust, and at least over the southern half of Enceladus, there is a liquid water ocean trapped under the ice, kept warm by tidal effects, perhaps a little bit of radioactive heating as well. Um, and those jets of water that are coming up through the cracks in the ice are venting to space, carrying organic material, and that molecular hydrogen. And that is very interesting because it's not a chemical equilibrium. And if there is one surefire sign of life, it is that it is out of chemical equilibrium. That molecular hydrogen points to being a waste product of some biological activity going on, perhaps down at the rock water interface underneath all that ice on little old Enceladus there. So not only a Titan and Enceladus interesting, but the other moons as well, and they don't get very much press. The uh, nature of Rhea and Dione particularly as being water containing ice worlds is just astonishing. So thanks very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy this and the other videos in the series.